Hello, I'm Curtis Hartshorn, and this is another class on reaching new levels of faith. It is a short review in chapter or in class number eight. We talked about how did Peter search out his faith, did a character study. Then we did another character study of Job. The next one talked about Job and the practical struggle. And then in our 10th class, we talked about how do I solidify my faith? How do I make my faith solid? And then in our last class, we talked about up again, down again faith. And so I think we're ready to do another character study. So for class number 12, we'll talk about what was so great about Abraham's faith. When we talked about faith, and if I name, ask you to name one of the most faithful characters of the Bible, you would probably think of Abraham. He was called the father of our faith. And yet we looked last week in our class on up again, down again faith that Abraham is one of the most classic examples of having high highs and low lows when it came to faith. So really, what was so great about Abraham's faith? Well, let's look in, chapter, uh, in, the, in Hebrews chapter 11, and uh, we're going to look at how Abraham's faith was so great. A, under this, by, by faith Abraham took God at his word. And then under that number one, Abraham left the comfort of his native land. In the Hebrew account, the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, it says in verse 8, By faith Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And when he went out, not knowing where he was going, by faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. When God told Abram to leave his father and leave his land, he said, go and I'll, I'll tell you where to stop. You just keep going and I'll, I'll let you know where to stop. And God stopped him in a foreign land. And I don't know if you've ever been a foreigner. I, I went to India one time and I don't look like I belong in India. I don't look like them. I don't dress like them. I don't talk like them. And so I know what it's like to be a foreigner. Well, that's what Abraham did. And he did it at God's command. And so that took a, a great amount of faith. And really what it boils down to here, number two, is God said it and that settled it. You know, in Genesis chapter 15, when we actually look at, at the command, if you'll turn with me there, Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6, it says, Then he believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Now this is right after God had told him that his descendants were going to be as, as numerous as the stars. There was a promise made to Abram, and this is before he had children. You're going to have numerous uh, descendants. And yet, uh, you know, he says he just believed God. If God said it, that settled it in Abram's mind. And that's what made him a man of such great faith. Abraham believed, even though he did not know how God was going to accomplish this promise. He had no children. And yet he said, okay, this is, this is what God says. Then I have every confidence that he's going to do just that. Let's look at another aspect of, of Abraham's faith. You know that by faith, Abraham passed his beliefs on to his son Isaac. I didn't really catch this one in the Bible when I was first studying, and then I happened to watch a movie, and it showed Abram teaching Isaac about his faith. I thought, wow, is that really in the Bible? Well, it actually is. Number one, he invested time in Isaac, teaching him the ways of Jehovah, and it's recorded in Genesis chapter 18. Starting in verse 18, it says, Since Abraham will surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him all the nations of the earth will be blessed. For I have chosen him, so that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. Since Isaac was the only child, really, of Abraham and Sarai, I know that you know, Hagar had Ishmael, but the only really direct descendant was Abraham. And it says that Abraham was, was commanded to, 
command his children to teach his children the ways of the Lord, then he obviously took the time to command Isaac and to teach Isaac. I want to share with you this quote here by uh, President Dwight D. Eisenhower. He once said that the best answer for too much government in Washington is better government at home. There's a lot of wisdom in that. We need to make sure that we teach our children, that we pass on our faith to our children. And I know I covered this when I talked about imitating faith, but it is so important. When you think about if your children are important to you and if your faith is important to you, then number two, any parent who teaches their child to serve God shows they love their child and their faith both. And I hope that's the case with you. Another thing that made Abraham's faith so great, we know that by faith, Abraham interceded on behalf of other people. Staying here in Genesis chapter 18, we see starting in verse 22, that there was, and this is right after Abraham, by the way, has found out that God is going to destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and that is where Lot lived. It says in verse 22, Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom, and while Abraham, Abraham was still standing before the Lord. Abraham came near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you indeed sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing. Now keep in mind, he's talking to God. Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous and the wicked are treated alike. Far be it from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? And so the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare the whole place on their account. And Abraham replied, Now, behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord, although I am but dust and ashes. Suppose the 50 righteous are lacking five. Will you destroy the whole city because of five? And he said, I will not destroy it, if I find 45 there. He spoke to him, and this is Abraham speaking to God, yet again and said, suppose 40 are found there. And he, God said, I will not do it on account of the 40. And then he said, oh, may the Lord not be angry and I shall speak. Suppose 30 are found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. You see what he's doing? He's bargaining with God. And he said, now behold, I have ventured to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the 20. And then he said, oh, may the Lord not be angry. And I shall speak only this once. Suppose 10 are found there. And he said, I will not destroy it on account of the 10. As soon as he had finished speaking to Abraham, the Lord departed and Abraham returned to his place. A man's faith is reflected in his concern for the welfare of other people. And here is Abraham boldly going before God and pleading for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, these wicked cities. Why would a man do something like that? Well, I'm sure he was concerned about his nephew Lot but he cared about the welfare of other people. And because of that, he interceded, he went before God, and he asked God to please spare these people if he could, if he could find 10. And that's, a, that's kind of the sad part of this story is God could not even find 10 righteous people in that city of Sodom. And so, you know, he, he destroyed it. But the, the point is, is that Abraham, a sign of his great faith, was the way that he cared about other people. Remember just a couple of classes ago in, in class number 10, I talked about Mark chapter 12, verse 28 through 30. And that's where Jesus was questioned about what is the greatest commandment. And he said, the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. But I want to look at the next verse. I'll put that up here on the screen for you. Mark chapter 12, verse 31 says, and the second is like it. This you will love 
your neighbor as yourself. There is no command greater than these. The greatest command, according to Jesus, is love God. But the second, he says, is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So loving your neighbor yourself is like loving God, according to what Jesus is saying here. When we show love to our fellow man, that is saying how much we love God. We don't often think of it this way, but the way that we treat one another is an expression of our faith. Because of my faith, I treat my fellow man this way, probably better than, than we deserve. God is commanding us to be benevolent, to care about other people. And so when we stand on God's word and we do that, each time that you do something good for another individual, you're doing so as an expression of your faith. Number two, you know that Abraham wanted protection for the innocent. He said, what about the righteous people? I know there's, there's people that, that deserve to die, and of course we all deserve to, to die separated from God because we're all sinners. But he says, what about these ones who are righteous, who have, uh, who have perhaps lived the right way? He cared about them. He wanted protection for those who might be suffering with others. It's, it's such an injustice when we see innocent people that are, are killed, perhaps in war, as we're witnessing right now in our, in our world, where people who are in a war and there's innocent people who are dying. And it seems so wrong, so unjust. Well, if you have the heart of Christ, it, it bothers you to hear about things like that. It bothered Abraham. So much so that he went to God. Let me ask you this question, number three. Could you carry out so bold a conversation with Almighty God? Do you think you could do what Abraham did in this chapter and stand before God and say, God, what if there are 45? What if there's 30? What if there's 20? Could you actually go through that conversation? Can you picture yourself standing before the Lord and having that conversation? Don't tell me Abraham didn't have some pretty amazing faith to be able to do something like that. Let's look at the next point, D. By faith, Abraham witnessed the miraculous birth of his son. And number one, this happened because of his faith, according to Hebrews. So we'll go back to Hebrews chapter 11, where we were before. And this time we're going to read verses 11 and 12. It says, by faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful, meaning God, who had promised. Therefore, there was born even of one man and him as good as dead at that, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. It was by faith that Sarah was able to bear a child and she did so by a man who the Bible says is as good as dead. That's not a compliment, by the way. Abraham was very old. She herself was quite old. And yet they were able to conceive of a child. Why did they get to do that? Why did he get to witness something like that? Because of his faith. You know, when you have great faith, you get to see things and witness things that other people miss. By faith, he was able to witness this miraculous birth of his son. But then, number two, the ultimate test of Abraham's faith was when God told him to offer that son up. In Genesis chapter 22 and verse 2, he says, Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. The Bible says that Abram got up early the next morning and he went to offer his son. I think when we look at the life of Abraham and we look at his faith, surely this event stands out as an ultimate test of one's faith. He loved Isaac Dearly, this was the son of promise, and yet he was not even hesitant to do what God said when God said, I need you to offer him up. 
It would have been so easy to rationalize that. I mean, put yourself in Abraham's situation. You could have said, well, you know, God never wants a human sacrifice. He never commands us to make a human sacrifice, so surely this is a mistake. Or he could have said, yeah, God, I'll, I'll do that, and, and waited till maybe noon or, or in the evening to go instead of early the next morning. I mean, it would have been so easy to rationalize this and say, yeah, surely God doesn't want me to offer my son up. We know the story that God never did allow him to carry out the sacrifice of Isaac, but he was willing to do it. And as soon as God saw that he was willing to do that, he stopped him. He says, don't offer your son. I know that you love me. I know that you care for me. I know that you have your faith in me. You know, when you're ready to offer up your most prized possession just because God says, I demand it of you, then you have some pretty amazing faith. What kind of faith do you have? Do you have that kind of faith where you can trust God? Whereas if God says, this is what I want you to do, whether you understand it or not, whether it makes sense to you or not, are you willing to say, God, if this is what you want me to do, this is what I'll do. There's so many other examples we could look at. You know, I think about the life of Paul and how Paul was not, oh, he was Saul of Tarsus before he became the Apostle Paul. He was the Pharisee of Pharisees. It would seem to us that when Paul, when Saul became the Apostle Paul, when he became a Christian, that he would be the person that you would send to convert the Jews. And yet we know that Paul was the apostle of the Gentiles. To us, it makes no sense. But this is what God wanted. And of course, it worked out really well. Paul was very effective in reaching many people in the Gentile community. We often find ourselves in a situation where we don't totally understand what we're doing. We may not understand what God is doing through us. But we need to learn to stand on His promise. In closing, Abraham was not a perfect man, but he trusted God. In the same way, we're not perfect, but we can trust God. We can say, God, I understand this. Reflect back to when we first started talking about what faith is. And remember the faith fall where you, you fold your arms and you fall back and you trust people to catch you. We need to do that with God. Say, God, I trust you. Here's what you've asked me to do. I'm folding my hands. I'm falling back into your arms. I trust you, God, to catch me and to carry me through. That's what faith is all about. Our goal with this faith is to get to that point that we have mature faith. But can I even reach mature faith? This is a question I often get asked when I get to this stage of the class and Really, mature faith is the only one we haven't covered. We've talked about the other four levels of faith. We've talked about the struggles of searching faith. What about mature faith? Is that something I could even achieve? Before I show you how to reach mature faith, I need to show you that it is possible and that you can reach mature faith. And that is our next class. And I look forward to sharing that with you.